Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to Red and Yellow. So I'm actually on campus, so I get to be part of the beautiful building today. And thank you so much for joining us today where we're going to be talking about digital marketing in 2021. We're going to reflect on some of the things that happened in 2020 and talk about what to expect in the upcoming year. So for those of you who don't know me, hi, my name is Di, Di Charton. I'm one of the senior lecturers here at Red and Yellow. I've spent my years coming out of the industry and now I'm involved in mentoring the minds of tomorrow, something I feel very passionate about. And obviously, um, something very close to my heart and that has a great amount of interest is this fascinating world of digital marketing. So I'm just gonna get straight into it. And um, oh, by the way, if you have got any questions during the session, please put them in the Q&A. Um, we've got an amazing team on our side who are managing things and they'll hopefully get, get uh, to those questions. If we've got some time at the end, um, I'll open it up to the floor. Okay, so just starting off, I just want a caveat here and I hate a crystal ball. I'm definitely not sitting here trying to tell you what the future is going to look like. What I hope to do is be able to talk about some of the things that we've seen as becoming really important and things that we need to take into account when we're thinking about our strategies, our plans, and our development this upcoming year. So starting right up front, I love a Biz Trend article. In fact, I love a trend article. I read voraciously, I listen, I watch consume, I think there's so much that can be learned from clever people. And one of those is Faiza Khan, and in her latest Biz Trends article, she spoke about something, and I thought it was a great way for us to actually start, that she, she spoke about a concept known as VUCA. So this was utilized by the American soldiers during the Afghanistan war. And she spoke about this whole notion of VUCA was a term that they used, which has become which has now subsequently come to describe what we can now term our pre-COVID world. So volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. You know, it, it wasn't just COVID that has seen all of these things become a part of our day-to-day -day lives. But since COVID, what we've seen now is a move towards what been, was termed by Wired magazine as Barney, Danny. Brittleness, anxiety, non-linearity and incomprehensibility. There's just absolutely no doubt about it that everything feels different. Everything has changed. Let's accept that. Let's know that it's part of the plan and that's what's part of what's happening in the world at the moment. And go, how do we start to address, how do we understand what this means for us as businesses and us as marketers? So Salesforce, um, released their state of service fourth edition towards the back end of last year. And they picked up some amazing trends of things that are happening in South Africa right now. So first off, 87% of South African service professionals have seen an increase in customers using digital channels. We know it. It's not just anecdotal. We've now got the science to back it up. 86% of South African service decision makers say that they are accelerating their digital initiatives and 78% said that they have invested in new technology. You all would have seen this meme. I know it was um, definitely shared ad nauseum amongst numerous groups that I was part of, but I think there is some truth in this matter. I think that our shift to being locked in our houses, to not having the human connection that we did, moved us closer and closer into these digital channels. And, you know, kind of we really saw COVID accelerating so much of the growth that we already seen. And so what it was is that the pace of change has accelerated. And a number of, of experts are saying that we're seeing and levels of adoption that have increased, you know, that we brought forward by five years. So that's what's happened. You know, all of a sudden, my mother-in-law is comfortable on a live video stream which was something that would never happen in the past. And that's just anecdotally. Everywhere around us, we've seen this massive adoption. We've seen this pace of change that has accelerated. 
Mackenzie also put out a survey, um, the results of the survey at the end of October, or beginning of October. And they put out a report about how COVID has actually pushed companies over the technology tipping point and pretty much put it in a place where it will transform business forever. And something we've been talking about quite a lot within this space is that we're now seeing, and McKinsey highlights it in this report, that your digital and corporate strategies are now one and the same. That yes, we've been saying this for a long time, people who've been in this digital world have been saying for a long time, we need to be integrating digital into our thinking. It's not just another channel, it's not just another marketing tool, it's fundamental to everything that we do and we need to think about from a business and from a brand perspective. But now, the, the, what happened in 2020 has really accelerated it and we've seen that, that integration now really coming to the fore. So with all of these things that are changing and we're seeing this rapid change all the time, we've been asked to understand, to, to take on change and to be malleable there's something else that we need to consistently be mindful of, and that's getting the basics right. And what I mean by that is that, you know, if I reflect on last year's IMC, NetBank IMC conference that took place in the middle of last year, one of the key themes that came out from that conference was this need from businesses and the server, the marketing industry, to ask these questions of who are your customers? We're still asking, who are our customers? How do we better understand them? How do we see and understand what they need and what they want? Because ultimately, people are at the center of everything that we do. And we need to be cognizant of that. And as much as we're going, yes, let's look to everything that's changed, the basics of connecting to people and putting them at the center of what we're doing is becoming more and more critical. Somebody else is absolutely brilliant is Jian Chang. And he spoke about, again, in his Biz Trends article, and I just love this quote. I thought I just had to put it in. Because he says, customers are no longer where you thought they were, and they might not be needing what you thought you were selling to them. It's that kind of massive change of, are you selling the right thing to the right people? And where are they? And what do they need? And I think this year, we're going to see ourselves asking that question a lot. We're going to need to reflect. We're going to need to deep dive. We're going to need to understand. And it sets the tone for what I want to be talking to you guys about today. So it's interesting. I think there's two fairly distinct things at play that might feel like they're very different, but I think that they are looking to converge. And the one is about looking at the humanizing side of things and deeply understanding and connecting to our customers. And then also looking at tech and all of the incredible tools that we have at our disposal at our disposal to do that. So in order to better understand this, because guys, I could literally have done something that I could have spoken to you about for the whole day, and we still wouldn't have even gotten through everything. I've tried to summarize today's talk into three key buckets. So first, I want to look at needs. Um, the needs of customers, needs of people, um, some of the trends, some of the changes that we've seen happen there. Then I want to talk about responses. So responses from us as industry, as leaders, as individuals, um, as people within teams and what that starts to look like. And then finally, I want to end up off looking at some of the tools and particularly some of the digital tools that are available to us and some of the shifts and changes that we've seen within that within the year. So, Let's get started at the needs. So there's a couple of different things that I'm going to take you through. I'm going to take you through talking about practicality being the new premium. I'm going to touch on state of mind because I think you can't not within the current environment that we're operating in. I'm going to talk about the rise of social impact and active citizenships. We know privacy, always a hot topic and back in, back in front and center. And then I'm going to go into nostalgia. So to start with, there was an amazing quote that I saw that Sawyer Armstrong put out in a Think With Google opinion piece. And she said, people priorities have shifted to a lower rung on Maslow's hierarchy. As a result, we've adjusted our spending toward essentials and we create products that truly meet our needs. 
And if you think about it, for a vast, for a majority of us, it's certainly not, not how it is across the entire world. But at a certain sector of the population, we were shifting and our needs were focused on much higher at Maslow's hierarchy. Safety and security were not necessarily something, fear of disease, fear of dying from something that we couldn't even see, it wasn't really something that was massively on our agendas in 2019. And suddenly it came to the fore in 2020. And I think what that's done is it shifted people's priority. Practicality, practical solutions, things that meet my needs are becoming more and more important and have come further to the focus. So what it means for us as businesses and brands and marketers and the entire industry that services these customers is to think about human-centric practicality. So it comes back to what I started talking about, the gift for people at the center of everything that we do and understand what they are looking for. They're looking for practical solutions to really help them. Then we can't talk about our current state of affairs without looking at state of mind. Pharma Dynamics put out this study towards the back end of last year that was conducted in South Africa. And it is, it's scary. I think anecdotally, every single one of us knows people who have struggled, we ourselves have struggled. It has been a really tough time. But the thing with us and the role that we play is that we have to be able to read the room. We have to realize that this is how people are feeling. And you have to be empathetic around that. And you have to understand that as brands, as in the position that, we, that we're in, we need to understand what our consumers are going through and we have to be able to display empathy. The other thing that we saw a massive rise in 2020 was active citizenship and social impact with people really getting to understand their privilege and understanding the role that they need to have in giving back. Um, and you've just seen outpourings of incredible support, you know, for somebody like, you know, these screen grabs that I've grabbed here, ladles of love, the, the fire that ravaged Massey and the amount of people that really came out in incredible support. And I think what we've seen is that people want to get involved. They really felt they could see and they could understand a need to do more and a need to make a difference. And we'll con con continue to see that. Privacy, again, has come into the spotlight. I think, you know, as we know, WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal was all over the news. Um, and I think, you know, you're still getting mass panic messages going out from people. It is something that we realize that as people in this industry, we've always known that nothing is for free, that you pay with your data, or you pay with information, personal information. But what we're starting to see is a greater awareness of that and how people, how it's actually affecting them. From a professional perspective, the long-awaited Act, the Personal Protection Act, is finally coming into play. And this will also then have an impact of how we interact um, and the way that we treat information. And I think if we just hold that basic premise of respect in everything that we do, we'll be all right. And then finally, one of the other trends that we're seeing that I think is really interesting is nostalgia. If you just think, so Blinding Lights was one of the top songs of 2020 and it really harps back to like the, the 80 synthesizer day you know we had wonder woman 1984 we've had people re-watch watching reruns of friends it's been this whole hark back to a time of nostalgia of something that that felt a little good and felt maybe for some people a bit safer and i think it's also understanding this as brands and as marketers that people are looking for opportunities to feel good. We need to understand that. We need to be, be bearing that in mind when we think of how we're going to be communicating with them. So on that note, I'm going to move on to kind of our responses. So looking more or less at about how the customers have changed, but responses and how things are, are changing in our world. So there's a couple of things I want to talk about. I want to talk about brand, behavioral brands 
bank activism and sustainability. I want to talk about an increase in collaboration, how our roles are changing, and also how we're seeing shifts and changes taking place within leadership. So just to start with behavioral brands, so this is something, this is not new. Uh, I love talking about this, and I've spoken about this on numerous occasions, but Ogilvy produced what they called the Red Papers a couple of years ago, um, and they spoke about brands that do building behavior brands. And I absolutely love it because I think it is exactly what our world is asking for now and our consumers are asking for now. So behavior branding asks brands to do and not just say. It demands that brands stop asserting beliefs and actually start demonstrating value. So pretty much what it is, is that we've been told, we've been sent a very clear message that challenges absolutely every part of the business. We've been told to stop making empty promises. We need to start acting in new and different ways. And when we talk about a behavioral brand, it's not something that lives within a marketing team. It's something that needs to live within an entire organization because somebody will experience your brand at any point and they will see that as the brand. So an interaction that they might have with a salesperson, somebody, an interaction that they might have online, actually using your product, all of that is, you know, comprises their experience of who you are and what that brand actually means to them. And consumers are saying it's not good enough to just say, you have to say and you have to do. So it's about doing and being. And it's about thinking, how do we shift from telling people to actually baking it into everything that is within our culture of our business. So behavioral brands are doing and being. And this leads me very closely onto the next point, which is brand activism. Just as we've seen a massive increase in consumers going, I'm going to get involved. I'm going to do something about this. I, I feel strongly about this. They're expecting the same thing of our brands. So Kantar Research was, um, released some data last year, and it said consumers expect brands to take an active role in social conversations and are increasingly putting them under pressure to voice their stance. I speak about this a lot. It's not good enough anymore just to stand for something. Consumers are expecting our brands to stand up for something. And what that means is it's very different. It's not just having a, a campaign that goes out over Breast Awareness Month that says, we love you, woman, you know, and let's do something around breast awareness, and then thinking that that's enough. If it's important to you, you have to stand up for it. And we saw it. We saw the backlash of people coming after brands who never stood up, who never said or did anything around the Black Lives Matter when they thought it was important to them. So standing up for something is it's something that we're going to see more and more pressure being put on. But you have to think very carefully because you have to go back to that first point that I made about behavioral brands. You cannot just do a performative gesture. People see through brand virtue signaling. So it's no longer good enough to just say, yes, jump on a bandwagon and then disappear. We have an informed consumer who researches everything that they see. And if you say that you are for Black Lives Matter and you don't have the right representation on your board and you do not have employment policies that talk to that, you will get found out. So you need to think about what's important to you, what is baked into your culture and what's important that you can be, that you can be a brand that is being and doing. Something for me that that I think talks specifically to this is that over the time of our, the, the peak of the Black Lives Matter movement, we saw 25% of all beauty ads representing a diverse color background into, in, in their models of the ads. Unfortunately, within two months of Black Lives Matter quieting down, this had dropped to 16%. Clearly, these brands were there for a moment. They weren't saying that this is something that we really deeply understand 
that we're reacting. And this is not how behavioral brands do things. And this is not true brand activism. More and more in 2021 and moving forward, our customers are going to call us out on this type of behavior. It's just not good enough. And it comes to this, this consistency versus seasonality. So it's consistency. It's about going, what do we need to be talking about? What is important? And then doing that over and over. Something else that is an absolute overused buzzword, um, and it shouldn't be, because something that is so, so, so important is the role that we as brands and businesses need to play in protecting our three Ps. So sustainability at its core is going, how do we look after people, planet, and profit? And it's not just about short-term goals, it's about going that everything that we do has sustainability over a period of time, that it doesn't, it understands the impact on social, it understands the impact in, on environmental, and it understands the impact on financial. So this is still something that unfortunately we are not getting right. But our consumers are asking for greater attention to be paid in this, in this regard, and more and more organizations are paying greater attention to sustainability and we'll see, continue to see this increase. And for me, what's so important here, it comes back to two key things. It comes back to authenticity and it comes back to commitment. Because when you commit to sustainability efforts, it's a long-term goal and you have to do it in an authentic manner. It's not simply to appease an audience. It's because it needs to be baked into what you do and who you are and that leads me right back to the point number one about behavioral brands that I took you through. The second thing that, the fourth thing, sorry, that we're going to see is around greater collaboration. So we're definitely going to see an increase in collaboration with creators, with young creators out there who are producing incredible content that allow brands to connect to communities. And I'm going to come back a little bit later and also talk some more about influencers, but that allow them to connect with smaller communities um, that are building around these interesting creators. And I think also with it, we're going to see some other things that interestingly that are going to come out. So, you know, kind of uh, there's, there's a trend of departments of curators being put in place to actually curate these incredible pieces of content that are coming from all over the place and packaging them for brands to then be able to, to figure out which brands would be the best ones to partner with them. So we're gonna see greater collaboration with creators. I definitely think we're gonna see an increase of collaboration across agencies. I think that there's been, we've seen a lot of individual competition over the years. And I think that what we're gonna see is a greater collaboration with different skill sets and with different offerings. So it's not just going to be a small niche agency collaborating with one of the big guys. We're going to see greater collaboration taking place across the board. And again, we know that we're living in an absolute rapidly changing world. And for me, one of the things that's been quite concerning, I feel, about the industry of the last couple of years is it feels in so many instances we've had breakdown of communication and understanding between clients and agencies. And I think the need now, the changing role of the CMO within, within the client world and the massive um, new ideas, learnings and understanding of the technology that comes from the agencies is going to create a stronger and tighter collaboration between clients and agencies. And then very much so is between departments is because all of a sudden now, digital, true digital transformation doesn't take place until it is bought in by everybody. So it's not something, a realm that sits within the marketing team or the client service team or even the sales team. It needs to live across an entire organization. So we will definitely see an increase of collaboration between departments as people navigate this new world that we're finding ourselves in. And that leads me to our change in roles and how we've seen things change. So a study that was done in um, by World Wide Works speaks about the fact that 67% of South African small businesses struggle to source the right tech talent. But 
On the flip side, only 14% actually plan to upskill their existing team members to help close tech skill gaps. So there is a massive gap. But we also have the shift where people are working from home and pretty much people can work from anywhere. And what that does start to do is it starts to change the potential landscape because all of a sudden, I don't necessarily need to hire somebody who works in the same city as me or even in the same country as me to be able to do the work that I need done. If I can't find those skills, I can source them from literally anywhere. It creates great opportunities on both sides and it creates some challenges because we've got some amazing people in this country. We know we've really got a, short, sort, a shortage, but suddenly they can also become that much more appealing to international organizations looking at hiring from anywhere. We've also seen kind of this whole role of like the C, are you the CMO, are you the CIO, are you the CTO, what are you? And pretty much that role is still consistently evolving because from a marketing perspective, we said that very much at the forefront of understanding the digital adoption and the importance that we bring in terms of understanding customers means that this role will consistently change and consistently be an important one around the boardroom table, which I'm going to get to. And that leads me on to our sixth point is around leadership. First of all, we know it, managing remote teams is something that will continue. So people are going to need to think differently about how you are a leader, a motivator, an inspirer, um, somebody you can maximize and help people get the best out of themselves and their environments that they're working in, while at the same time understanding the challenges that they have. Going back to what I said earlier about needing to have empathy, connection, all of those things, Managing remote teams will continue, will still continue to challenge us as leaders. Stepping up to the boardroom table, you know, we've been speaking about it for a long time, that kind of the role of the marketer around the bed, the boardroom table is so critical, and we're finally going to be seeing the stepping up taking place of that. Leaders nowadays need to remain completely, completely agile and need to be able to, to really roll with the punches and roll with the ships and roll with the changes because they are going, going to continue coming. Um, something that a lot of experts are talking about is about ensuring you have a budget safety net. You know, it's a couple of kind of things hidden away that allow you to be able to react and be agile based on ships and changes that could very well take place. And ultimately, having that unenviable task really planning for the unplannable because 2020 wasn't anything what we expected and you know kind of we're going 2021 hasn't started the way that we were hoping it to so you have to plan for the unplannable okay finally moving on to something which um will probably be what a lot of you have been wanting to hear about because now we start to move much more into the digital aspects of things start to look and unpack and understand what tools are available to us and how we're going to be able to use these effectively. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of things that I want to take you through. So I'm going to be talking to you about omni-channel delivery, um, about user experience, about looking deeper into data, understanding personalization, you know, look at some things around Google, look at social, and look at influencers, uh, video and audio, and finally we're going to be tapping into augmented reality. So let's start off with omnichannel delivery. So we definitely saw it. I showed you in the stats earlier from Salesforce that we've definitely seen an increase in usage within this space. We've seen massive growth in different areas. Um, and so many businesses who for a long time were purely reliant on their physical stores really coming up and doing some amazing work within the digital space. I have to highlight Checker 6060, which spent an incredible amount of time prepping and getting everything ready for its launch and consistently tweaks and changes, and in some ways has changed what people expect from an online delivery service. Um, you know, we've got Take A Lot, which we all know about, and we've had incredible startups like Quench, 
come in and find a gap within the market and, and plug that hole. McKinsey again speaks about the fact that retail globally is going to be changing quite dramatically. So they were looking at, as you can see, that e-commerce takes a huge, huge jump um, in 2021, jumping up to 19% of all purchases. So we literally are seeing a global move of, and you know, kind of, of people moving into this online space. As things like retail environments become less appealing, while we are uncertain about our health. But that's one thing, and people, you know, we always go, yes, okay, that's fine internationally, but what's actually happening locally? And Business Insider South Africa put out an article where they spoke about the fact that our e-commerce sector is set for massive, massive growth. And if you look at some of the, the key indicators, so FNB, said that the average e-commerce spend grew by 30% in the first half of 2020. Rand Merchant Bank expects that this whole sector's value will surge by 150% to 225 billion rand within the next five years. One day only recorded 128% increase in sales by mid-2020. And then Take a Lot increased its revenue by 28% in the year to March, and that was before even lockdown started. So it's just very clear that the trajectory is there for clear growth and for massive increase very much within this e-commerce space. So some of the things that we realize, though, are challenging within the South African context, sit around data and sit around fulfillment, because Data costs are still prohibitive to the vast majority of South Africans. And it, up until now, there hasn't been great performance at all within our township areas. So certain sectors of the population are being fulfilled very well within the, um, by the e-commerce sectors, but we're still having massive, massive gaps. But as we know, where there are gaps, there are opportunities. Um, I came across an incredible entrepreneurial company called Yebel Fresh, who are doing deliveries to Kailicha here in Cape Town, where what they're doing is they're using it all off WhatsApp and creating opportunities for online deliveries, utilizing local people within that community. So we are, as we know, South Africans, where we find problems, we look for solutions. And I do think that we're going to start to see more of these Yebel freshers coming online and starting to have an impact that will ultimately help to grow this e-commerce sector even more as we break down some of the challenges that we're dealing with. Then moving on to my next thing that I wanted to talk about, and it's about UX taking a seat at the table. So I think so many of us who've been in this game for so long have been absolutely shocked that UX hasn't been given the attention that it deserves based on the importance of people at the core of everything we do. So just as a brief outline for those of you who aren't 100% like a fair with it, UX aims to actually fulfill users' needs. It looks to provide positive experiences that keep users loyal to the product or brand. And ultimately, I think what is so critical is it just, it starts to define customer journeys that are then most conducive to business success. So something that I love that Toby Shapshak, who is the publisher of Shack, actually wrote in Daily Maverick. And it comes back to the Checker 6060 app. And something that he said is, but the most enjoyable thing is how slick the M commerce interface is. As a long time online shopper, I've been beta tested by everyone since Amazon. Some mobile apps are, well, frustrating. The interface isn't optimized properly for mobile. So buying something or adding it to a wish list can sometimes require multiple click-throughs to individual pages, then back again and again. What a joy that 6060 lets you add a product or page or, or change the amount of buying or delete it right next to the search results. This has resulted in a much smoother, less time-wasting experience. So guys, caveat, I don't work on check. Checker 6060 got no involvement with them whatsoever. But I think the reason why I wanted to focus on this 
is this is now becoming the norm. My mother uses the Checker 6060 app and she's terrified of technology. Are you as easy to use as all the other tools that I have? Because that's what you're going to get judged by. And you'll need to ensure that your user experience and that your user interface and everything comes together and delivers a seamless experience that compares to everything else that I use on a daily basis. And I think that's why we're going to see UX finally gaining that seat at the table. We then need to look at digging deeper because everybody talks about data and we've been talking about data and data and data and data for many, many years and we will continue to do so because it will continue to be important. But something happened in 2020 because someone broke the crystal ball. Everything that we thought we knew, everything that we had seen in the past, how people had behaved in the way that they did things in the way that react to things completely changed. We really, we had an entire world being completely upended as so many things changed. So it needs us to go back to basic. It needs us to re-examine, to re-understand, to, to consistently look on what the new behaviors like Dion Chang said. What do the new behaviors look like? What are the new expectations look like? What are the new needs look like? Plus, we also saw the launch of GA4 coming out towards back in the weeks of last year, which again is going to require us to look at things differently from our analytics suite. So some of the main biggest changes that they've looked at is instead of being channel focused, they're much more user journey focused, much more events focused, and are applying machine learning to help people get a better understand of actual behavior. So I think we're going to see some big changes coming now with GA4 being implemented. And we're going to have to do this. We're going to have to revisit and refresh our measurement plans. Data is only so good as the questions that we ask. And data is only so good if we use it to get insights that help us move forward. So we're definitely going to need to be asking different questions in order to actually understand what we need to be doing and how we need to be reconnecting to our consistently changing customers. Then guys, there's no doubt about it. We live in a me on a me. We are very, we're becoming more aware of people around us, but ultimately at the end of the day, it is all about me as an individual. And what we will see is personalization will scale massively this year. We've started to see it. We've been talking about it again, many, many, you know, kind of so often, but I think what we're going to see is it will really start to scale. And this is not personalization. Hi, Di, um, just included as an email. What we're seeing from a personalization is the behavior of some of the brands that we interact with. Again, how do you behave in terms of compared to the other brands that I interact with? You know, as we know, Netflix, you watch Netflix, it gives you recommendations. Um, Spotify, gives you sample playlists. Netflix tells you, compared to what you bought last, last time, things that you can do now. Yuppie Chef have always done phenomenally well in terms of personalizing it with an old school handwritten note in an unexpected, with, with unexpected in a delivery. So personalization is something that so many different brand experiences are giving us. And we're gonna expect it more and more and more to make things easier for us. And it's quite a tight road, you, it's, it's quite a narrow, um, you, you don't have much leeway because you've got privacy things that you need to be mindful of, but still we're looking for private, you know, kind of personalization. So it's going to be a very interesting type road to walk. Then I wanted to talk about this whole race to zero and very much the rise of the featured snippet. So it's all been about position one, but now we've definitely seen a massive increase of looking and making sure that our SEO efforts actually allow us to get to that position zero, which is the featured snippet. Because within that, that, um, that zero kind of position, you are seen as being an expert, you're seen as being a leader, you are seen as being an authoritative voice by Google to be granted that position. So we're definitely gonna see a lot more people pay very close attention to that race to zero. We've also seen shifts and changes within Google where they are focused on intent. 
So it's what is the intent of the user and it's going to continue to grow as well as the whole notion of eat. So are you and on, is your site and your brand, do you display expertise? Do you display authority? Do you display trustworthiness? Because those are going to be very critical in terms of your ranking. We're definitely seeing that local is lacquer. Um, and it's not just from consumers looking to support local as well. It's also a big focus on local search and needing to ensure that we have factored in localization into all of our SEO efforts. And then also, we're going to consistently and it's going to keep on creeping up the rise in voice search. And we need to ensure that we have adequately planned for that and also understood the user behavior, how the user behavior is different behind and how you know, we would have much longer key, you know, long tail keywords with a voice search as opposed to kind of typing onto our laptop or into our phone. Then I think you can't talk about any digital trend, digital marketing, what's happening if you don't check in with the world of social, which is always having such a massive impact. And um, I, again, used some data that Worldwide Works and Ornico put together where they did and they looked at specifically the SA social media landscape. Because again, I think it's so important for us to understand what the international trends are, but also look specifically, how's it impacting us here in South Africa? So something that is really interesting is that brands are exceptionally active within the social media spaces. So if you look, these are the top brands that were interviewed and nearly nine in 10 of them are active on Facebook, 77% on Twitter, 75% on LinkedIn, and 68% on Instagram. In interestingly enough though, the investment within the social media spaces from an advertising perspective looked like it was coming down. So we're gonna be keeping close eye on that to see what happens there. But you will see that there is a very, very big child missing out of that. And that is definitely TikTok, where we've seen exceptional growth. So we now have more than 6 million users in South Africa, um, yet only less than 20% of brands um, actually had said that they had tried any form of delving into TikTok in 2020. More than a third of these brands are saying that they're looking to utilize it in 2021. And I think, again, it's looking at how do you utilize it effectively? And I think a lot of brands are still getting their heads around going, how do we understand the medium? How do we understand how people are using it? And how do we ensure that we come in there and add value and not just add noise? Some other trends that we're seeing within the social media space talk to the rise of social commerce. We've seen it. We've seen the ability to shop from our social media platforms, and we definitely will see an increase of that. Um, live streaming, which is not necessarily something new within the social spaces, has suddenly gained much more attention as a greater section of the population has gotten used to doing things like a webinar, um, Zoom calls, Teams calls, kind of live streaming is going to be something that, again, we're going to see um, a lot more happening and being an uptake within the social media spaces. And then the other thing is user-generated content. So user-generated content has always been vital to brands, and it has always been something that any person within the space who is good at their job is consistently going, how do we encourage new user-generated content? But we've seen a greater focus taking place again now within 2021 on ensuring that this is baked into our strategies and into our plans. And leading on to that leads me into the world of influencers, where I definitely think in 2021, we're going to see what we call micro-influencers having a macro impact. So data come, global data admittedly, shows that in 2019, the influencer market was worth 8 billion US dollars. But in 2022, it has jumped quite significantly to 15 billion dollars. That's what they're anticipating. And I think 
the primary growth is going to happen with the micro influencers, not necessarily the macro. So it's not people who have over a million followers. We'll still continue to use them, but as brands, we're looking to become part of communities. We're looking to, to connect with communities and form those stronger connections. And a lot of those communities are being pulled together by those micro influencers, by people one to 10,000 um, followers. And so a lot of this is going to be driven within the social spaces where we're going to see greater collaboration, like I spoke about earlier, between creators and brands happening within the micro influence space and very much also within that social media platforms. We're going to continue to see some interesting um, growth happening in what we can just call sight and sound. And I think definitely from a video format, we're seeing um, the introduction of shoppable videos, which I think is also, we are video mad, we love it, particularly short form video. We're seeing again, just a massive increase um, in that, as well as the live stream. So shoppable videos, short form videos, live stream, Video is super, super, super hot right now. It has been for the last couple of years and will continue to be so. Um, and it's driven very much by our consumers who like to consume this. TikTok just shows you that. We also, interestingly, seeing a massive rise in the amount of people who listen to podcasts. So there's also um, so massive, just different on different topics. People are using podcasts as a way to learn more things about the world around them. And we can continue to see a growth in podcasts. So if you do not have a, an audio and a video component of your strategy right now, best you get on it. And then the final thing that I wanted to talk about just from a digital tools perspective is the fact that augmented reality finally goes mainstream. So I know that you know, definitely being one of those digital geeks at times, I have been so excited. I was so excited when AR first came into play and it's taken a long time for us to feel like we're getting somewhere with it. But something happened in September last year and that was that AR actually disappeared from Gartner's hype cycle. So what does that mean? So it means that they are no longer seen as being an emerging topic technology and they're actually being seen as being something that is going to move into massive productivity within the space and we're starting to see more and more businesses and brands and people utilize AR so you know you can now on Shopify you can actually they are allowing AR technology Sam Smith launched his latest single diamonds using AR on Spotify. So they are, there's more and more elements of this coming into play. And when it starts to move into pop culture like this, when it starts to get adopted by singers who are utilizing it for their, their latest releases, I think we're going to see that more and more and more brands are going to be following and realizing the incredible opportunities that AR can present to them. But all of this, you know, when we look at all of these tools, we look at all of these incredible things that we have at our fingertips. Tracy just put it really well also in, a, in an article that she wrote for the BizCom Trends. And she spoke about the fact that experience has shown that technology is an exceptionally powerful tool to support and augment a communication strategy. But the root, the core should always be authentic human connection. Technology for technology's sake is just a gimmick. When the ore subsides, there's an empty shell. However, if technology is the vehicle to deliver authentic, meaningful connections, the results can be astounding. And I think it's why I started out with understanding people at our core and then understanding the tools. Because when you merge the two together, that's when we can create effectiveness. If we bring the humanizing and we bring the technology together, and that's where we can become effective at building those strong connections. And finally, my final point, just in terms of understanding 2021, is at a point where we all feel stretched beyond, we are going to be asked to invest because 
we do, we need to invest in tech. We're going to need to invest in people. We're going to need to invest in skills because the technology is allowing us to do things that we never could before, to connect and understand in ways that we never could before. But we do, we need people to get us there and we need the skills to get us there. And as hard as it can be sometimes in a compressed um, environment, we are going to start to see investments taking place within this space. We have to have meaningful insights that are driven by data because like I said, that crystal ball's changed. Um, our consumers are changing, their needs are changing. We're going to need to be understanding the data and putting the meaningful insights out of it to make us more effective at our jobs that we do. Um, and culture and creativity are the new oil. They're the new things that fuel us. They're the new things that really are fueling businesses in terms of and brands and what that looks like. Um, and an interest in people is still absolutely core to everything that we do understanding what it is, what makes them tick, what's important to them. And for me, my most important thing is curiosity, is that if, for us to be effective, not just in 2021, but moving forward, if you want to be effective at anything, you have to be curious. You have to want to learn and know more. At Red and Yellow, we have a big sign that you get to see as you walk in, which says, I am a sponge. And for me, it's the most perfect thing to aspire to all the time is to just be a sponge, is to seek out, to learn and grow. Consistently say there are so many clever people out there to listen to, to follow, to read, to talk to, and just to learn from. It's part of also why we talk about here at Red and Yellow, this going on a lifelong journey of learning and consistently knowing that you have to keep on learning. And guys, this was all relevant pre-COVID. All this is done now is just accelerated for us to make sure that it re-highlights the importance of just consistently learning and growing. And my final point to you guys is that just, unfortunately, I think you have to, and every single one of us has to just get comfortable with being uncomfortable. We will need required, we will be expected to change, we will expect, we'll be expected to suddenly do things differently to what we've ever done before. But if you can get comfortable with that, and if you can embrace that, then 2021 could be a great year for me, for you guys, and I really, really hope it is. Thanks, guys. Get in touch if there is anything that you are interested in hearing more from us or learning more from us. We'd love to hear from you. And even though I can't see you, it's been an absolute pleasure spending this hour with you. And thank you so much for your time. It is really, really, really much appreciated. I will, thanks everybody. I'm gonna see if there's any questions that haven't been answered that I need to follow up on. Okay, Mohammed actually had a great question here. He said, how can companies balance standing up for something and people saying they're faking it? Mohammed, that's a great question and it comes back to what I was saying. It comes back to authenticity. So if you do a short-term response and say, yes, yeah, we're all for this, and then nothing that else about you talks to that, then you are faking it. So it comes down to it's more work. It's kind of doing your homework to push it forward. And then you have to be consistent. That con consistency and authenticity are so, so important. Um, and yes, uh, Lissetia, we've got how much of the external forces are contributing on the shift of, on, me, on people's needs, on Mazda's hierarchy? Absolutely, it's all external. It's external forces that are having an impact on people and that's why they need them to shift. Um, then, uh, we've got how do companies deal with so many mediums like WhatsApp where fake news can spread and you can't correct factuality. So it is so true, Mohammed. I mean, yeah, Mohammed, it's a very valid point because um, fake news and people spreading misinformation is definitely something that we have to be cognizant of. It is, you know, it's about having your finger on the pulse. And as hard as that is, it's where it's important when I talk about building communities of people 
around you and around your brand who understand you. Because first off, they will highlight and they will say to people that's wrong, that's fake. But in another sense, they will also then start to say, they will be the ones who will alert you to you and bring it to you and say, this is what's being said, this is what's being happened. And then you will need to go into your normal crisis communication with things like that. Um, yes, so Neo, thank you. Great question about, you know, if we look at Checker 66 in Pick and Pay, I've been doing it for years. Why is Checkers more successful than the Pick and Pay one? And I think, you know, I, I think we're going to see so many case studies of this um, coming out and I have no doubt about it. And I think one of the big things was they, they really looked at the user experience. They started what they thought, they started from the beginning and they worked hard to do their pre-planning and to give the best user experience that they could possibly do. They assembled some teams of really, really smart people and invested in it. And I think that comes from the thing, when I talk about investing in the tech, they invested in the tech and I think the dividends are starting to show. Could you share any practical tips that small businesses and brands with tight budgets can use to engage personalization? Yeah, you know what, I think that is a very good question. Sorry, at least see who asked that, Clint. I think one of the first things is that you need to start with um, capturing a database. So it is, I um, kind of, when I was in Joburg, I went to a coffee shop and the, a gentleman barista served me and asked for my name. And every time I went there afterwards, he remembered my name. I will go back to that coffee shop every time now. Personalization is something where I'm recognized as being something different from anybody else. So they are, depending on what your, your, your business or your brand does, you, there's many different ways of doing it. But first, first, first and foremost, you need to be looking at how do you capture data and how do you utilize data? There are also an incredible amount of tools that are available that are also automated tools. So just if we look from a social media perspective and you look at, you know, even say YouTube or um, Facebook, we have opportunities of tools that can help us personalize some of our content to be more in line with the needs, the, the behavior of some of the, um, of the users. So, it's about the segmentation and then about creating different opportunities to personalize on that way. I wish you the best of luck for your journey and thank you so, 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 so much for joining us today.